Once again, welcome to my class. My name is Mr. Koresh, and today we are in grade 9, uh, looking at adaptation. So sit tight, relax. Don't sit tight, relax, and let us continue. So first, we need to understand what adaptation is. Uh, it's a word we use loosely, but uh, it has a very simple meaning. Uh, let's look at this. It says, some living things are hard to see. Why is it difficult to see them? Um, they are able to blend, uh, that's the mix with the background, and uh, being able to mix with their background so you can see them is a special trait, it's a special characteristic or feature that helps them to survive. Uh, because they are able to blend in the background, um, they are less likely to be seen and eaten, and the also they are less likely to be seen when they are going for you to come and eat you. So all these things, we call them adaptations. So adaptation is a change in a plant or animal trait. When a plant or animal changes something about itself, that's adapting. It's doing so so it can fit in the new environment. These special traits help them to survive. The longer they survive, the more offspring they can have. More offspring means a species has a better chance of survival. If you don't have a lot of offspring to replace you, when you die out, they also will die. But if you have a lot of them, then there is a better chance for them to continue your life. So special traits can be passed from parent to offspring. So in brief, adaptation is about uh, the change in the traits of the organism or their behavior so that they are better able to survive. That's what adaptation is about. And uh, we today are going to look at the adaptation of um, um, six organisms. Um, that includes the fish, the toad, the lizard, the bird, uh, man or mammal, and we'll end with water plants. How are these organisms adapted where they are staying? So, let's look at some examples of adaptation. Take a good look at this picture. Are you able to make out something? All right, now if you look closely, you can see an organism there. Now you see how this organism has a blend or mixed with the background so that at a glance, you don't see it. So except you look very critically and when organisms are moving, they don't have that time to look closely to see what is this. And uh, so, if you are an organism that is going to feed on it, you'll pass by not noticing it is there. Likewise, um, if you are something it is going to eat, you'll come not knowing it is there. And uh, when you reach, when you are within, you know, capturing distance, then they will just capture and eat you. On the other hand, plants, huh? look at this cactus. The, it has needle-like leaves. Okay, it doesn't produce those big, big leaves. It has very small leaves that looks like lindul. Uh, why or how is this an adaptation? They live in desert. Now, desert conditions, water is the biggest problem. There is very little water or no water at all. So, because they receive very little rainfall, they don't want to lose water. And, but how are they able to carry out photosynthesis if they have these tiny leaves? Well, in desert, sunlight is in abundance. So they have sunlight a lot. So even with tiny leaves, they are capable of uh, uh, carrying out photosynthesis. So, like I mentioned, we're looking at these uh, uh, six groups of organisms. First, we start with fish. Uh, they belong to the class Pisces. Uh, if you're asked to indicate the class of fish, uh, fish itself is enough as a class. So if you can't remember Pisces, just write fish. General characteristics of fish, <coughs> we've already mentioned they belong to the class Pisces of fish and uh, we know they are vertebrate animals. In fact, all these five groups we are talking about, they are all vertebrates except for water plants that are a different group, but all the ones we are talking about. So if you don't see the word vertebrate, still remember the fish, the lizard, the bird, the toad, and of course, a small mammal, we're going to look at, they are all vertebrates. Uh, vertebrate mean they have the vertebral column, or they have the backbone, 
and um, they also have an internal skeleton. Mm -hmm. Having an internal skeleton means your skeleton is said to be endoskeleton. They live in fresh water or in the seas, the fish we're talking about. They reproduce by laying eggs, excuse me, they reproduce by laying eggs and the fertilization is external. Uh, if you remember earlier lessons, we mentioned that. Uh, fertilization being external means the egg and the sperm meet outside the body of the organism. Now, fish are streamlined in their shape, um, enabling them to move with less friction. This is um, the idea of a uh, streamlined shape. Now you can see uh, if, the, if that's the fish, when it is moving, the water is simply easily going around the body. But if it was not having that, uh, having that shape means uh, that's what we refer to as having a streamline, meaning the stream of air is, uh, your body is so designed that the stream of air can easily flow over you. Uh, if they were having another structure, imagine like, um, say they have a box shape, then that one is not streamlined, and the air, or in this case, water that is, you are going to go through, will uh, be a barrier and it will be stopping you. When you have this shape, it's easy for the water to split and uh, go over your body. That's a very important characteristic that fish have. So briefly, before we go to the next page, um, their class is Pisces, and uh, <clears throat> they live in water, they are aquatic, they lay eggs, fertilization is internal, and they have a stream body. Um, their bodies are covered with scales. These are bony plates made in the skin. They overlap each other and give a protective covering. Let's take a look at the scales of this fish here. So they are so neatly, you know, lined or overlapping each other such that uh, they make it easy for water to move over them. Um, in addition, these scales also, uh, the skin produces some mucus-like structure that makes the scales slippery so that when it is moving through the water, friction is reduced. They possess fins which give stability and control direction of movement during swimming. Um, they've circled two of the uh, fins here. That's another fin. And there's another fin, and there's one not very clear here. So the fins, what is their work? It pro pro provides stability. So the fish is stable, so it doesn't wobble, doesn't like, like we say, I'm standing, I don't want to fall down. So I have mechanisms, I have things in my body that help me to stand upright. The fish in the water also need to remain in that position. It doesn't want to fall. Even when it is running or fighting or moving around, it must be able to maintain that position. So it is the fins that help it do that, but they also help it during movement, so it's able to move. Uh, largely, the tail fin is the one that is used for that, so that it's uh, able to push the fish through the water. They breathe by means of gills, which we'll look at later on. Uh, that's a special adaptation that you find only in organisms that live and stay in water. Uh, they have a lateral line that detects vibrations and movement in the water. It's more like the organ that helps them to hear. They are not specifically hearing, but they are able to know when there is motion, or when there is movement in the water. And they have swim bladder that is filled with air so that uh, it can help them when they need to float. Because um, even though they are in water, they are also having weight. But uh, how do they adjust themselves so they can float in water or calm down? If they need to float, they uh, allow air to come into the uh, air sac. And with that, that makes them buoyant or light, and then they can float up. So again, to remind you that they have scales that cover the body, protecting the body, and also helping to make it easy for water to flow over them. They have fins for movement and for controlling them so that they don't, um, for them we say so that they don't wobble, that is they don't fall sideways or whichever way, like we are standing, that's how we are supposed to be standing, you don't want to fall down on the ground. They have gills for breathing, the gills are so designed that they are able to take oxygen from water. Uh, other organisms like us are not able to take oxygen from water, we are designed to take oxygen from the air. They have this lateral line that 
is very sensitive to any little uh, vibration that happens in the water. Even it is claimed that uh, the vibration could have occurred up to like up to a kilometer for some organisms and that vibration is felt by the lateral line and the fish knows something is around it. And the swim bladder that helps them to float. Now, there are these terms um, I always feel I need to take my time to explain to children so they can understand. Um, it says an ectoderm is an organism which derives the heat it requires from the environment. So whatever heat um, it, it needs, it has to get it from the environment. In other words, unlike the endoderm that creates the heat it needs from internal chemical reactions, uh, the ectoderm is not able to generate heat. It's like, um, look at it this way. Uh, your friend has a generator, so he is able to make generate, I mean, create energy, electricity for himself. But you don't have a generator, so you depend on the light that is coming from your friend's uh, generator. So that's the picture of ectoderm. Ectoderm, they cannot make their own energy. They cannot keep themselves warm, so they have to get heat energy from their surrounding. But endoderm, I mean endotherm, they are able to um, make the heat by doing some chemical reactions inside their body. So it says a common misconception is that an ectotherm is cold-blooded. That is not uh, quite right because uh, as we'll see in the next slides, um, there, is, there are some that are ectotherm, yet they are not cold-blooded. Um, we also come across homeotherms and poikilotherms. Now, homeotherms are animals that have a constant body temperature. They're able to keep the body temperature at a constant uh, rate. Whereas poikilotherms, they are unable to keep the body temperature constant. Uh, it keeps varying. I mentioned something about that earlier on. Uh, if the temperature coming around is too much, their body temperature will keep going up, up, up until they do something. If they don't, they are going to die. Uh, likewise, if the temperature in the surrounding is cold, if they don't do something to you know, regulate it, their body temperature is going to go down, 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 and so on. So let's look at these four terms again. Ectotherm, organisms um, that get the heat from their surrounding, they cannot make it. Endotherm, organisms that make the heat by chemical reaction. Homeotherms, those that are able to keep a constant body temperature. Poikilotherms, those that are unable to keep a constant body temperature. So let's look at this picture. <clears throat> now we have the homeotherms here. And um, these homeotherms include the dog here and certain fish, so certain big fish. Huh? Now, but when you look at uh, down here, now this is where it gets interesting because um, here is uh, a hair that we expect to be able, uh, that we normally would call uh, warm-blooded. But you can see in this case, it's a poikilotherm. Okay, it's poikilothermic, meaning it is not able to keep a constant body temperature. But it is able to generate its own body temperature. That is why it is under this group, endotherm, like this dog. So it is endotherm because it is able to generate heat by chemical reaction, but it is poikilothermic because it is not able to keep a constant body temperature. And uh, this becomes um, useful or necessary when they want to hibernate. And some of them that live in those cold countries wherein the place becomes so cold that I they will not be able to carry out any life. So they go and hide somewhere and they bring down their body temperature to a very low state and they're able to survive through that. So the dog here is homeothermic, meaning it is able to keep a constant body temperature. It is endotherm, meaning it generates its own uh, temperature. The fish is ectotherm. It gains heat from the surrounding, but it is able to keep the body temperature the same. So even though it's taking heat from the surrounding, yet it is able to keep that temperature the same. But this guy here is endotherm, means it's able to make um, its own heat, 
but it is unable to keep it at a constant level. So which means if the place is cool, um, it must keep generating heat to keep warm. Or if, uh, on the other hand, it wants to keep cool, then it will just allow the heat to be uh, going out. Um, the frog is both an ectotherm, meaning does not make its own um, energy, and it's a poikilotherm, meaning it cannot keep a constant body temperature. Um, if it's a bit confusing, don't worry yourself much. What we need to pay attention to is, um, you look at these terms in two ways. Now first, endotherm generates heat. Ectotherm does not generate heat, takes heat from the surrounding. Now you come to uh, poikilo homeotherm, keep body, constant body temperature, and uh, uh, poikilotherm doesn't keep constant body temperature. So let's look at each of the groups in detail. Tilapia, um, some of the important things to look at, the fins. Mm -hmm. uh, the fins that are like our limbs, because all these groups, they are said to have four limbs. So what are the limbs? You have the pectoral and the pelvic fins, okay? And these are in pairs. So the pectoral are the hands, the pelvic are the feet. Now, this dorsal and the ventral, they help to keep balance so it doesn't fall. And the tail is like an extra part of his body whose uh, function is, in fact, it is the one that is, it's actually using when moving because by, you know, moving it through the water, it's able to move its body. Um, I mentioned the lateral line. Um, this diagram shows this to help you identify it. Okay, it has these two. Um, and then we have the operculum covering the gills. Then you have the eye and the nostril and so on. So we'll look at those things in detail. Uh, another way, or I mean another diagram, mostly in your exams, this is how, um, they, this is what they will be uh, giving you. So um, the different parts that I was talking about, of the mouth, the nostril, the eye, the operculum, pectoral fin, pelvic fin, the anus is slightly in front of the uh, ventral fin, the dorsal fin, and then the caudal fin. Uh, sometimes in the exam they'll ask you which fins are paired. Think of the arms, pectoral, pelvic. Which ones are unpaired? You have the dorsal, that's like saying the back, and ventral, the front, plus the tail. These are the single fins. So we take a look um, at other parts of the fish. The gills, we say they are the respiratory structure that uses uh, what we call counter, excuse me, counter current exchange to extract oxygen from the water. Uh, here is a picture of uh, the head of a fish and the gills are uh, shown there. Uh, you can see they are pinkish in nature. And uh, you have a, a bony structure there. You can see the rakes there that help to filter the, the water as it is coming to the body of the fish. Uh, we have the operculum that is this cover, but here it's been removed. Uh, the operculum or gill cover that uh, covers the, the, the gills. And the lateral line I already mentioned, hmm, you can, if you look carefully, you can see it here. And you have a tiny one here. Uh, we say is a row of microscopic organs that are sensitive to pressure changes and they can detect low frequency vibration. So they help the fish more like hearing and also they help the fish to know the pressure of the water. Because remember as you go deeper into the water the pressure changes. They must know, they, they must be able to detect uh, the pressure of the water because this is uh, vital to their existence, huh? because if the pressure is too much or too low, that can also affect them. So they need to know what the pressure is so they can adjust their bodies accordingly. So again, the gill for uh, breathing, operculum that covers the gill, lateral line for helping to detect vibrations and pressure, and the swim bladder. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes we cut open a fish and uh, what's the swim bladder? Uh, you have to be careful because inside the body, the, org I mean, the organs there, they are usually having similar colors, but then the shape is what we are going to use to help us identify the swim bladder. Um, it's like a balloon, small balloon. But by the time you have your fish, 
the balloon will be deflated. So it might be something very small. Uh, you might not, it's, you don't meet a fish that have a bloated balloon. Because once it's killed, it loses the control over this and then the air escapes. Okay, but if we look carefully, we can see the gill is shown here. The heart, um, the liver, the intestines. But we, don't, we are not interested in those ones at this stage. What we are interested in is the swim bladder. So it is an internal air-filled sac that acts as an organ for buoyancy in a bony fish. Um, for sharks and other types of fish, they have some kind of oil that helps them to remain buoyant. Buoyant means being able to float. So with this swim bladder, they blow air into it somehow. And once it has air, it helps to make the fish lighter. So the fish is able to flow at ease. Scales. <clears throat> These are small plate-like structure covering the organism or part of the organism. Uh, so sharks, fish, reptiles, and birds, they all have different kinds of uh, scales. So what we're trying to say is you have scales on the birds, especially their legs. Uh, for reptiles, they have it all over the body, and fish also you have it all over the body. They serve the same purpose, protect the, um, the skin of the organism. Now, the fins we already mentioned, they are paired appendages that are found on the fish and they're used for two main things, huh? locomotion and steering. And the tail, the pectoral and the pelvic are for locomotion. Uh, particularly the tail is for movement and uh, the pectoral is, pectoral sometimes is used for steering, you know? like you, you're moving, you want to bend right or left, you adjust your arms. But uh, the dorsal and the ventral fins, they help to keep them in balance. Reproduction. Now, we already mentioned this term in one of our lessons. Huh? Uh, oviparos, these are organisms wherein eggs are laid in a nest or in the ground and they hatch later. Now, all these organisms are oviparos. They lay eggs and the organism will mature and uh, hatch later. Viviparos, these are um, <coughs> organisms in which internal fertilization takes place uh, with live born young. As soon as the egg is fertilized, it becomes an embryo and develops as a fetus. So like man and uh, the tiger here, uh, when the egg is fertilized, it multiplies to form this and later it begins to form into uh, the young organism, uh, which is the embryo, later it will develop and become a mature, um, fully developed organism that is called a fetus or later on baby, and then that is born live. So those groups of organisms, we call them oviparos. Now the, I mean the viviparos, sorry. So once again, oviparos, they lay eggs. Viviparos, they born the young live. Now you have the ovoviviparos. They produce young by means of eggs, which hatch inside the body. So once the eggs are fertilized, they stay in the... I mean, in the case of this group of organisms, the eggs are fertilized outside. And after fertilization, the parents take the egg inside their body. They stay there. And when they are mature, they hatch, and then they come out. So those groups, we call them ovoviviparos. They produce young by means of eggs which are hatched within the body of the parent. Snakes, you can have some snakes that are uh, going through this process and uh, some people say they are giving birth. It's different from this one. But this one, there's no um, egg that is, um, uh, f you know, like no laying of eggs. The, 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 the fertilized egg develops into an embryo which develops into a fetus and then the fetus is born alive. So we look at reproduction in the fish. <coughs> most reproduction, I mean most of them reproduce sexually through external fertilization in a process that is called spawning. Now during spawning a female fish releases eggs into the water then a male fish swims over them and releases uh, sperm. So you have the female releasing the egg, and uh, as it is releasing the egg, the male comes around, and the male spreads sperm over it. All of this is happening inside the water, and it is so designed that uh, 
a lot of the eggs are fertilized and then once they are fertilized then they will continue development. So um, we look at other body parts of the fish. We have the nostrils. Um, these are the organs of uh, you know, smell. Okay, so for them it's not for breathing, it's for smelling um, chemicals in the water. And the eyes, um, they have a very big, very huge pupil that is covered with some kind of a membrane uh, so that it's able to f uh, move through the water um, because uh, it doesn't have anything covering the, the, the eyelid. The eye is just open. And uh, so that's part of the adaptation also. It must have that special membrane so that uh, it's able to move through the water. The eyes must be open. And if you and I open our eyes in the water, we feel the pressure of the water. But they have a special membrane over the eye. The mouth serves for taking in food, for protecting young, and in some instances, uh, for, uh, for even protecting young ones, because they, once the eggs are fertilized and uh, the young ones hatch, now some groups of fish, especially like tilapia, they actually collect the young fish into their mouth, that way protecting them. But most important, they are used for breathing in water because the mouth are involved in breathing. Uh, for the fish to breathe, you must open the water to let water come. And then the water will now pass through the gills and it will open the gill cover so that the water can pass through. So in some instances, you are required to be able to draw, or well not to draw at this level, but you are expected that you should be able to name the parts of the um, the, the fish, you know, the nostril, the eye, the parts of the gills, and the operculum that has been caught away, right? So the gill structure and the method of ventilation are adapted to exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide with water. It's so designed that it is capable of um, that exchange of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide in water, which all other organisms cannot do. The gill filament, in some instances, you might be questioned to know, to be able to label the parts. So you have the, this soft area, which is where the respiration is taking place or the exchange of uh, gases. Uh, that's the filament. You have this structure that's called the gill arch or gill bar that helps to provide, it's made of bones, or, so it helps to provide um, uh, the support frame. And then you have the gill rakers. They help, like the name implies, they're acting like a gill, I mean the rakes. So the fish opens the mouth. When water is coming, uh, if there is anything that is going to contaminate or uh, disturb the, the, the gill, because the filaments are very fragile, uh, the rakes will stop those things. Right? So the filaments are separated by the water and expose a very large surface area. So it's something that really spreads out wide. So there's a lot of uh, tiny pieces of tissue there that makes up the filament. And what, how does that help the fish? It provides a very large surface area for exchange of gas. Um, the gill bar, through it, you have blood vessels that branch into the gill filament. So that makes it very efficient for those blood vessels, capillaries, to collect whatever oxygen that has been absorbed and then they carry it to where it is needed. At the same time, they bring in the waste gas, carbon dioxide, and then that flows out of the, uh, the gill. So they create a system where in blood ves they, uh, you have blood vessels which send branches into the gill filament. And the walls of the gill filament are very thin. So we're talking about adaptation here. So how is this gill filament adapted so it is able to do its work properly. First, the filament itself provides a large surface area. You have the blood vessels in the gill uh, arch or bar that uh, makes blood available. And then the walls of the filament are very thin so that oxygen can easily pass into and carbon dioxide can also easily pass out of it. What's the importance of fish? Why study tilapia fish in particular? Number one, it serves as food. And uh, in several communities where there is a uh, stream or small bodies of water, uh, tilapia can easily grow there. 
people catch them, eat them as food. Um, it also serves as manure because um, they remove the intestines and other parts that we don't want to eat. Now these ones are very rich in nutrients that uh, plants want. So once you mix them in your backyard, you can easily make money out of them and that will make your crops grow plenty. It provides employment and income for fish farmers and sellers. So either uh, people who just go into the rivers and streams and fish tilapia, others actually build dams, you know, some huge um, holes they make and put water there and uh, you bring one or two tilapia and uh, within a very short time you have a lot of them and from that you can make money. So it provides employment. So somebody that does not have work that engages in that will have work. It also provides work for the farmers, um, I mean the, the people selling. So because the farmers when they harvest the fish, the sellers will come and take. So fish is important in providing employment for both the people growing the fish and, or farming the fish and the people selling. And it provides income as well because uh, once you farm them, you have money that you can use to buy other things. And if you are a seller, you buy at a certain price, you sell with a profit, you get money so you have income. Tilapia is very important in helping to control mosquitoes that cause malaria. Um, the young of the mosquito, the larvae, you know, they grow in water. So if uh, you want to control that, you simply need to introduce tilapia into maybe you have a pond or so on, and they will eat up the, the, the young ones, and through that, they're helping you to get rid of mosquitoes. Tilapia also provides an abundant food source for aquatic predators. So where they're staying, they serve as food, also for those other organisms, they form an important part of the food chain. So you see, they eat others and others will be able to eat them. So that way the food chain will become a successful one. Uh, they are sometimes used to purify water by consuming vegetation. Because some of them, there are some kind of uh, vegetation plants there that they feed on. So if you put tilapia there, they help to clean up your water. Uh, you might have noticed in some areas where you have some wells um, or some ponds that Probably they're not using for drinking, but they can introduce tilapia there to help keep the water healthy. So this are uh, the importance of tilapia. Um, if you try to remember at least three or four, that will be good. But if you can remember all of them, that's fine. Food, manure, uh, employment, income, uh, controlling mosquitoes, uh, providing food for other organisms, and uh, keeping your water clean. Um, so the next organism we are going to look at is the common toad and this one belongs to the class Amphibia. Now, the toad is often confused with frogs. So what's the difference between toad and frog? Um, let's start with <clears throat> the skin. Okay? Frogs have thin, wet, smooth skin that has more color. They, their color is usually very clear to see. Uh, on the other hand, the toad, the skin is thick, not thin. It's almost the opposite of this. Thick, dry skin with bumps and usually they're brown. Brown is their usual color, but they can camouflage. They can take any color of their surrounding. All right. Uh, these ones, they lay their eggs in clusters, in groups, hmm? a huge group. While right. these ones, they also lay in groups, but this group is made up of chains. You know, it's like a long chain. Can be sometimes can be several um, meters long. So that's one another difference. But uh, what we can see, look at the body shape. Now this one looks thinner and longer. Uh, this one looks stout, you know, like a fat guy. You know? It's short and uh, not long, but then it's fat like. Um, the legs here, although we can't see them because they are already folded or flexed, they have long legs, the frogs, so they can jump longer distances. These ones, they have shorter legs and hence they move only very short distances. This one, most of their life is in water. This one lives on land. It only goes to water to breed. And the uh, movement, this one prefers 
to walk or do you know, little jumps, except if it is threatened, then it will do very long jump. But this one, most of the time, it prefers to jump when it is moving. So next time you come across them, think about those things, and that should help you to know which is which. Number one is the one you find on land mostly is the toad. Frogs, they hardly move away from water. They can be near the water or above the water in branches and so on, but you hardly find them purely living on the land. If they live on land, it must be somewhere that is very, very wet. The moisture level must be very high. I want us to look at the general characteristics of um, the amphibia, the class amphibia. Okay, first and foremost, they belong to the class amphibia. Um, they live both on land and in water. This is how they derive out the name amphibia. Okay, uh, it's a Latin word that means something that is capable of uh, living in water or and land as well. They reproduce by laying eggs, of course, and we've mentioned before, fertilization is external. And um, they're streamlined in their shape. That helps them in movement, particularly in water, because of the streamlined shape, so they're able to easily move through the water. And their bodies are not covered with hairs, feathers, or scales, so normally we describe them as having naked skin and they possess two pairs of limbs for movement. We'll talk more about that in the subsequent slides. They breathe by means of lungs, the floor of the mouth, and their moist skin. So you can see uh, where breathing is concerned, uh, they have these three structures they can use. And normally when they are resting, they would use um, the, the, the mouth and the, the, the moist skin. Uh, but for the toads, it's difficult if the place is not moist enough, then they cannot use the skin. They will be using the floor of the mouth. If they become active, like if they're jumping or running and something like that, then they need more energy, more oxygen, so then they will resort to using the lungs. Uh, they are poikilothermic. Now remember what we said about poikilothermic? It means organisms that are not able to maintain a constant temperature. The opposite of that is homeothermic. They are able to maintain a constant body temperature. Mammals are an example of that. Again, I want to remind you not to confuse that with um, ectoderm and endoderms. Now, ect I mean, ectotherms and ento endotherms. Okay? Now, ectotherms, you no, know, therm, thermal is heat. So, ectotherms are organisms that are not able to generate their own body heat. They have to absorb heat from the surrounding, like if they live in a warm area, they absorb temperature from the surrounding, like from the sun. And the endotherms, they are able to generate heat by chemical reactions in the body, and so they produce heat. And uh, so, it, just not to get confused, ectotherms, uh, endotherms, poikilotherms, and uh, uh, homeotherms. And uh, also they possess eardrums which detect sound vibrations. So remember the fish, um, for them they use the lateral line for detecting sound vibrations. But when you come up to the amphibians, they have the eardrum like you have in the birds and you have in mammals so that they can help them to detect sound. Generally um, for examination purposes, they will present you a diagram of the toad and uh, you'll be asked to label the parts. So the diagram will be there, you will have uh, labels, um, arrows from certain points and you're expected to be able to name these points and uh, in most instances they'll bring out three or four portions that they want you to say the functions. So. I want to bring out some areas that uh, are of unique interest. We already mentioned the eardrum for sound. The nostril is uh, both for breathing so that they can send air to the lungs and uh, for detecting the presence of chemicals in their surrounding, in the air. And of course the mouth, we say it's very wide and that is an adaptation because they sometimes catch some insects that are a little bit bigger and you need a bigger mouth so you can be able to um, 
fit in the insect so it can go down. Remember we said they have two pairs of limbs, two at the front, two at the back. And interestingly, the uh, front limbs, they have only f uh, four toes with no web. But the hind limbs, they have five toes and a small web. And uh, remember, the, f the, the web helps them when they swim in the water. Uh, the hind limb is much longer and very powerful. It's the one they use when they are jumping. You know? they, that's what they use to sprint so that they can jump. And at the top here, we can see the poison gland. <coughs> so named because it gives the uh, feeling of um, if an organism should try to ingest the toad, it will release this milky substance that is stored in a uh, part, portion of the skin there. This tastes very bad and the organism will feel like it, uh, it's taken in some poison and in some instances that helps to free the toad because it will be uh, taken out of the mouth. Others, of course, like some snakes, don't mind, they will eat it. So it, the so-called poison is really not a poison. It's just um, something with a very bad taste to help protect the organism so it cannot be eaten. So we've already mentioned that it is poikilothermic. Uh, it has um, <coughs> a loose-fitting, warty skin. Warty in the sense it looks like uh, something very rough. Um, like when somebody's suffering from some skin disease, it's very, very rough and scale-like, but there, of course there is no scale. And um, it's a very, I mean, it's a small organism. Some can be larger, but on average, they're about uh, 9 centimeter to 10 centimeter. They usually don't have any neck, but they're capable of, um, you know, turning the head whichever direction they want to. As, uh, there is a, actually a very short space between the head and the rest of the body. The head, we already mentioned, bears this very wide mouth which helps them to catch prey and uh, eat them. They have a pair of wide nostrils so air can pass freely and of course it helps them to detect the presence of chemicals. And they have protruding eyes. Huh? The eyes, you, in fact, it's one of the first things you'll see on the toad. It's right there at the top of the head and uh, they of course have that uh, membrane helping to protect the eye. Uh, just like in the fish, they have that special membrane which if they're swimming, they can be able to open the eye and the eye is not disturbed because they have the thick membrane, okay? Um, but uh, when you look at it, it says only the lower eyelid is mobile, but um, it has a folded transparent margin. Uh, that is the nictating membrane which I'm trying to describe. Huh? The membrane that helps them so that even under the water, they can open their eyes and yet they're able to see clearly. And uh, unlike other organisms wherein, like humans, we have the upper eyelid that is the one that closes and open. For them, it is the lower eyelid that comes up and goes down. The upper eyelid is fixed. Um, uh, the nostrils we mentioned, they have it. It opens into the mouth cavity and there is some kind of a mechanism, some valve mechanism that uh, ensures that they will be still able to breathe while, even when they are underwater because the valve ensures that um, things flow only in one direction and not in the other direction. All right. And uh, behind the eyes we have the eardrums and uh, which helps them to detect sound. Uh, we have this poison gland, I already talked about it, okay. It's there to help protect the organism because it's able to produce some unpleasant tasting substance uh, that serves as a protection against some enemies. Uh, the hind limbs, you can see all of this is highly folded um, and it's having thick muscles that help it to flex so that it can uh, jump when it is needed, uh, whether it is escaping predators or whether it is um, following praise, right? And it's important to note that you have a small web um, in the hind limb, which would help them when they are in water so that they can swim. Sometimes you encounter questions comparing the front and the back. Uh, one basic difference is the number of digits. Um, here you have four and here you have five. Another difference is the web that you have here and here no web. So let us look at some life activities 
um, in the tool. Let's first of all look at breathing, okay? Uh, for breathing, we remember we said they use the mouth, the lower part of the mouth, and they can use the general skin, and of course there is the lungs. So by raising and lowering the floor of the mouth, air is taken in and out. And the inside of the mouth, the lining um, is moist. So when air comes in, this air diffuses into blood capillaries and that is distributed to the rest of the body. Um, there is also the skin. Now here is an um, expanded image of a small portion of the skin. So you can see after a few cells, you have um, space wherein um, gases can diffuse. The inside here is moist and then so once the gas diffuses inside, it dissolves in the moisture and again that is taken all the way to the lungs and to the heart and then the organism is able to breathe by means of that. So but also most important, um, they have lungs for exchange of gas. The gas will pass through the nostrils and then they can exchange the gas in the lungs there. That is useful especially if um, the organism is engaged in um, <coughs> vigorous activities. As I alluded to earlier, if it is running or jumping, then it needs more gas. Uh, here is a picture of uh, the toad jumping. So at this point we can see it's in the air and it is about to land. So the front limbs, again, this is important because sometimes uh, you'll be asked about the function or the use of the front limbs. So whenever they jump, the front limbs act as uh, uh, shock absorbers, you know, so they land on the front limbs. And if they are moving, so immediately they land, then the hind limbs will also land, and then they spring or sprint with the hind limbs, and you can see it taken off again. And the same thing will be repeated. It will land again with the front and continue. Um, locomotion is by means of this. Sometimes you'll see them crawling, um, especially if they want to go and surprise a prey. But if they need to capture something fast, so then they will jump. But if it is being chased equally, they will jump. Now when the frogs swim, or the same thing for the toad, the webbed hind feet provide a greater surface area for pushing backwards on the water. and the smaller front limbs help to steer. So that is when they are swimming. But on land, this is what they will be doing, jumping, hopping, and uh, sometimes crawling. So for feeding, <coughs> it's interesting. They have this tongue that is sticky and uh, like glue-like. So you simply need to touch. You know? Okay, this is actually a piece of leaf. That's not what it is eating. If you look carefully, this area here, is a, you can see a brown something like a worm. So it just needs to touch the insect or the organism and then put it in the mouth. Uh, at other instances, the organism might be a little bit of distance away from it because um, uh, it's also part of their adaptation. They can't come too close, then the organism will notice there is a predator and it will escape. So what they will do is they come a bit close and then they you know, flick out the sticky tongue, and once it touches the insect, the insect can no longer escape, then they will uh, bring it to the mouth and uh, swallow it. They don't chew, but they do have teeth, especially at the front top, for grasping, you know, gripping the insect so that it cannot escape. But it's not for chewing, it's just for holding so that it can't escape, and then they swallow them whole. And um, the skin, we already mentioned, uh, helps it, the toad and the frog for breathing. But um, an interesting aspect is it helps them to camouflage. Uh, to camouflage simply means the organism blends very well with its surrounding so that it is difficult to see it. This has two advantages. One, because it can't be seen, it will come very close or insects will come close to it not knowing it is there until they reach a certain distance wherein the tongue can be seen and uh, pick it up. Also, it is there to help them to escape predators. So uh, predators will be looking, they may not see them because they blend very well with the surrounding, except when they move. And uh, of course, if they, if they sense that there is a predator around, they become very, very still. So 
no movement and hence since they have blend well with the surrounding they are not going to be seen so the skin helps in two aspects huh? the color provides camouflage and of course it helps them to um, <clears throat> to breathe the life cycle of the the toad okay we say um, all toads must return to water to breathe and because are they capable of uh, you know being in the water and of course being on land this is why they got the name amphibia so the eggs or sperms leave the body through the opening that is called the cloaca remember we mentioned about the cloaca one opening that serves as the exit for uh, sperm cells or egg cells uh, feces and the urine all together uh, fertilization we already mentioned is external so simply when they come together the female lays the eggs and the male produces the sperm so that the egg and the sperm will meet but remember it is happening outside the female's body so as the female is depositing the egg the male is um, fertilizing them uh, it is common to see the male on top of the female you know holding her tight and uh, so that they will be swimming and at the same time the female will be depositing eggs and the male will be fertilizing them um, they undergo metamorphosis this is the change from a sexually immature stage to a sexually mature stage in the life cycle uh, it involves change in the body structure and the behavior okay often um, you are required to compare the tadpole and the toad and also you have to look at um, tadpole how they are similar to um, uh, fish for example now let us look at the tadpole and the toad you see here tadpoles are herbivorous that means they feed on plants they are aquatic okay they live uh, in water and hence they need gills so that they can breathe and they have no limbs so they use the tail for swimming so when you come to the adults now they are carnivorous meaning they feed on animals they are terrestrial, they live on land. Of course, they are able to survive in water, but they spend most of their life on land. And uh, they have lungs, so they don't use the gills any longer. The gills disappear, they now use the lungs for breathing, okay? And for movement, they have four limbs. So simply, if we are to summarize, you can see uh, tadpoles are herbivorous, uh, the toads are carnivorous. Tadpoles, they are aquatic. They can't survive without water. If the water dries out, they, they, they stop surviving. Uh, the toads, they can survive without water. In fact, they are able to live on land because they have the adaptive features that will help them to survive on land, which includes the lungs and the limbs. And uh, also, uh, we see the tadpoles, they need gills so that they can survive in water. So how do they develop? Um, the jelly around the eggs, they have several advantages and sometimes you are required to be able to uh, say how these features help the organism to survive. Now, some of these uh, strings can be very, very long and that means you have, you know, several eggs attached there. Now, three basic things are captured here, okay? It keeps the eggs together and prevents them from being swept away in the water because they have to be laid in water and the, the, the string there, the gel, uh, the jelly around the eggs helps to keep them together so they are not scattered about in the water. That way they don't lose their lives. And uh, it also protects them from injury, mechanical injury and from drying up and also it prevents fungi and bacteria from uh, infecting them and then eating them up or killing them. And uh, lastly, it aerates the eggs. It gets them enough, you know, if each egg is inside something like a bubble. So there is enough air there for that egg to be able to breathe and uh, hence, of course, survive. So take note of this. Sometimes you are required to say um, what, um, what adaptive feature can be described or said about the jelly around the fish. So one, we're saying it helps to keep them together. Number two, it protects them from injury and the infection from fungi and bacteria. 
and uh, number three was saying it gives them or provides air for them so here are some diagrams showing you um, tadpole here it's at the very young stage all it has is gills I forgot to mention these gills are actually on the outside unlike what you have in the fish where the gills are inside and covered by the um, operculum or gill cover this one the gills are outside and at this stage which is not very far from this you can see the long tail the limbs are beginning to appear the hind limbs particularly and uh, the, you can see a very long tail but gradually both the hind and the front limbs are fully developed and uh, the tail really comparatively is shorter so it is progressing towards uh, the stage wherein the tail will finally disappear and then becomes a uh, young adult this is a summary of the entire process um, from the adult will lay eggs now the eggs um, hatch into the tadpole which is the larval stage and that continues here wherein the larva begins to produce legs at this stage it's having gills but uh, you know it's a gradual process and replacements are taking place so at this stage the gills are beginning to reduce and uh, the tails are growing longer I mean the limbs are growing longer the tail is becoming shorter and when you come here you have a young frog it's the same or similar story for the toad um, so the limbs are fully developed the tail is almost disappearing the gills are replaced by lungs and then of course we have the adult so most of these organisms were required to um, say their importance around us um, why are we even bothering to study them now we say frogs and toads are an important part of the food chain and they provide a very efficient transfer of energy okay they are in the middle of the food chain um, they eat organisms and in turn they are eating so they play a very important role and number two is that they help in consuming insects um, and um, they are an important source of food for other organisms like the bats, the snakes and animals throughout the food web. So whereas the food web is concerned or food chain is concerned, the toads and the frogs are very, very, very important. Uh, um, for humans also, they serve as natural pest control. So if you have toads and frogs in your garden or in your surrounding, they help to control the population of insects because that is what they feed on. Uh, they are also considered as uh, environmental indicators um, so that you can know your environment is healthy or otherwise because if you have toxins or poison or chemicals that will, um, <coughs> will, will harm you or harm the environment uh, toads are the first to pick that up now remember toads and uh, frogs don't have anything covering the skin so they are exposed and they can be easily contaminated so their presence in your surrounding is a good indicator that uh, your surrounding is healthy but if they all disappear it's an indicator that there's something poisonous around you and hence you need to protect yourself um, let me end here and uh, thank you once again for <coughs> sitting through my lesson uh, other lessons are yet to come so in the meantime once again, thank you for your time with us. My name is Mr. Kreish.